Sí. Sí, uh, hola, buenas tardes a todo el mundo. Good afternoon, everybody. Buen après-midi, todo el mundo. Para mí es un placer empezar esta colaboración entre la cooperación entre la Isla Caixa Foundation, el Club de Roma y, específicamente, el Office del Club de Roma en Barcelona y el Instituto Mediterráneo para el Mediterráneo. Y quiero agradecer por la buena for the good working conditions for these three institutions because we have actually committed ourselves to working long term and we will have as a start today's cycle and it will have as a vertebrating axis the 2030 agenda and secondly the Mediterranean perspective which as I've said beforehand wants to continue not only in this cycle but also beyond desde el Instituto Europeo del Mediterráneo, the European Institute for the Mediterranean, which is a think tank specializing in Euro-Mediterranean relationships, is highly committed with the development of cooperation between both sides of the Mediterranean. We believe that the implementation of these sustainable development goals is a unique opportunity, first, to face the common challenges we share both in Europe and in the Mediterranean, both south and east, not only environmental challenges, as will be discussed in this first cycle, but also in with regards to the other goals foreseen in the agenda. La Agenda 2030, the 2030 Agenda gives us a cooperation framework, a very relevant cooperation framework, which, is, which places us all on the same footing. And for the first time, we define goals that must be attained both by the North and by the South. So from that point of view, the fact parties, that we have commitments on both sides of the Mediterranean, what it allows us to do is to speak the same language and therefore to favor cooperation. Bearing in mind that there is a certain delay in the implementation of the 2030 agenda in the Mediterranean, it is necessary to promote this sort of discussion, not only to raise awareness about the need to have these instruments, but also in order to promote their uh, development. So, in order to start this debate, today we have Jaume Lanaspa, who is the chairman of the Barcelona office of the Club of Rome. Jaume, you have the floor, sir. Fine, thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to participate in this so-called ceremony to open this cycle, which has been organized jointly by the European Mediterranean Institute the Club of Rome, the La Caixa Foundation, and the special presence of Sandrine Dixon de Clerc, co president of the Club of Rome. And I'd like to also thank all of the participants, both the moderator, the guest speaker, and the discussant. Today's approach, as we all know, will be a joint approach to the 2030 Agenda, because if we do not do that, we will not save our Mediterranean. And this is very relevant in the sense that I personally will not see the disaster personally, but it is very important for my children and for my grandchildren. So we have to be fully committed to working jointly on an equal footing, as Joseph Ferrer has said. 
Another clear point is that, in my opinion, most Mediterranean citizens share different things. First of all, we share a feeling of belonging. Many Mediterranean people, a Mediterranean identity is a fundamental tree of our identity. Secondly, we share a very rich history that has not always been an easy one or peaceful. And in the past, we only have to think about the fact that our Mediterranean basin and right now is witnessing warfare between Israel and Palestine. And that's a tragedy. So this is what actually defines our Mediterranean. We also share a wish for peace and progress. We Mediterranean people, in spite of it all, we are peaceful people, in spite of what we're witnessing now. And we also share and I'm going to focus now on the most important point. We share a common destiny. We are fully convinced about this common destiny. And that probably was not true a few years ago. But right now, my personal feeling is that this common destiny feeling is growing fast. And we're well aware that our common destiny on both sides of the Mediterranean will be conditioned by the climate change effects, especially hard on our Mediterranean in terms of equitability, sustainability, and even survival possibility. That's why I congratulate you for having organized a discussion like the one we will have today. So allow me to greet all of the people who are following us remotely and specifically and very affectionately my co-president of the Club of Rome, Sandrine Dixon de Cleve. If you'll allow me, and let me just introduce a little bit of an ad. The Club of Rome has a number of peculiarities. First, a governance model that's based on two co-presidencies. We always share the presidency. Secondly, the president is have, has been in the hands of two women in two different continents. So the Club of Rome has a special sensitivity in regards to the main challenges faced by humanity. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jalma. The honor uh, to count uh, to in these uh, welcoming remarks uh, with, uh, count with the uh, participation of uh, Ms. Uh, Sandrine Dixon de Clef, co-president of the Club of Rome. Sandrine, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you for having invited me, and also to the beautiful words that have just been indicated by uh, Mr. Lanaspa and uh, also yourself in terms of your opening remarks. This conference and exchange comes at an absolutely crucial time, and you are right that the Club of Rome has decided to very much split its presidency between two women, one woman in Europe, the other in Africa, two continents that are very much seeing the impact, but also the need to work together as faced with this planetary emergency. The Mediterranean region is in between those two continents, is part actually to a certain degree of those continents. And the Mediterranean region is also a region, as was exactly indicated before, that teaches us very clearly the importance of the impact of desertification, the impact of climate change already in migration. We can see right now what's happening in Spain in terms of migrants who just came over from Morocco. We know that we will have an increase of climate migration coming from the Mediterranean region all the way through Europe. But we also know that as was indicated before, that if we don't work together now, as we face this planetary emergency, we will not emerge. This is not only the 2030 agenda, this is what we call the decade of action. This decade of action, which very much calls us to work on key sectors so that we can shift the impact and the mitigation potential on climate change, so that we can start to divest 
And we've just seen as well that Spain has done a very great declaration today, actually. And Teresa Ribeiro, your Minister of Environment, was just interviewed and a good friend on her work in trying to shift Spain, part of a very important shift in the Mediterranean region, towards a low carbon economy, to shift out of fossil energy. This is part of the conversation that we have to have in the region because our dependency also on fossil energy is very much interlinked. But then there is also the impacts on our oceans, the impacts on our land. In terms of our oceans, so many negotiations with regard to fisheries, overfishing, the way in which we can protect our oceans, but the same in terms of the way in which we use our land, the way in which we can shift to regenerative agriculture, the way in which we can ensure that we have proper carbon stocks in our agricultural regions. So the beauty of this initiative is that we work together as European Mediterranean citizens and governments, but also the Mediterranean governments on addressing the key issues of climate change, but also let's remember the key issues that often are also linked to geopolitics. We cannot disentangle the Syrian war from the conflict over water. We may not be able to disentangle some of the tensions geopolitically between Europe and the Mediterranean region, unless we look at migration and the impact of climate change on migrants. So all of these deep questions are absolutely fundamental. And the more we can try to work together to unpack the tensions, to speak about solutions, to speak about knowledge exchange, and to ensure that we work together so that we actually help the Mediterranean region join Europe on the journey to what we call a European green and social deal, the better we will be. I would like to maybe close with a few thoughts. It is fundamental as we come and we approach all of the major negotiations. We have before us the G7. I just spoke to the Italian presidency on the G20 and the declarations that finance ministers will be making around potentially debt for nature swaps, the way in which they can help in terms of sovereign debt across the rest of the world and bring more countries on this journey but also what we call the CBD COP, the Biodiversity COP, and also very much COP26, which will be focusing on climate change. So we need to ensure that when we have our discussions, when we understand where we can find solutions in the Mediterranean region, we also convince our governments as they are facing these very important negotiations of what the key solutions are and make firm declarations so that we can truly emerge from emergency. We published our planetary emergency plan three years ago, revised it now facing COVID. And we are convinced that by de-risking our economies through a decarbonized economy, through a regenerative economy, we will actually be able to bring greater well-being across the globe and across different regions. Let's use this as a case study in the Mediterranean region to see how we can better collaborate together to enhance greater well-being in the Mediterranean region as we move into this decade of action. So I am very pleased to be here. It's a very important event and I look forward to building with you so that we turn this event into action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandrine, to these wise remarks. Uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, now we will start with the dialogue itself uh, that will be moderated uh, by Arnau Coral, Director of the Advisory Council for Sustainable Development of Catalonia. So Arnau, you have uh, the floor. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I would like to, to start by, by thanking EMED, the Barcelona Office of the Cup of Rome and the Natasha Foundation for for the kind invitation to, to moderate this, this dialogue, the dialogue of climate and environmental change in the Mediterranean. Uh, this dialogue aims, as you know, at setting the scene of the conference cycle uh, by presenting the state of the art situation of climate and 
environmental change in the Mediterranean uh, basin. Uh, climate change, and I think everyone knows, is one of the most uh, serious systemic challenges affecting the Mediterranean basin. And actually, I would like to, to, to remind you that uh, in its fifth assessment report, the IPCC already considered our region as highly vulnerable to climate change. Specifically, the IPCC report pointed out that the Mediterranean would suffer multiple stresses <coughs> and systemic failures due to climate change. The first Mediterranean assessment report, uh, also known as, as MARO-1, on climate, uh, the first Mediterranean assessment report on, on climate and environmental change, MARO-1, prepared by the MEDEC, uh, the, the or I would say our independent network of Mediterranean experts on, on climate and environmental change, and the region is working faster than the global average. Sea level rise may exceed 20 to 110 centimeters by the end of the century, while annual precipitation rates will considerably decrease. Number one also points out that climate change is a phenomenon. Together with other human induced drivers of environmental degradation of the Mediterranean ecosystems, pose significant challenges for marine and terrestrial ecosystems, but also the human well being in, in the on both shores of the Mediterranean, especially, especially as regards water and food security. I would like to highlight the MEDEC report, uh, in which I had the opportunity to, to participate as an author and together with uh, Arnographs and some other colleagues uh, as a member of the MEDEC steering committee. Climate change policies need to be based on sound scientific knowledge and data, uh, coupled with awareness raising and technical capacities to ensure informed decision making at all levels. Recognizing and protecting the climate adaptation and mitigation services of natural ecosystems. Actually, this is a main message from the Mediterranean Strategy for Sustainable Development 2016-2025, which recognizes that scientific knowledge and tools on climate change are not sufficiently accessible and used for decision making. The MEDEC created in July 2015 aims in order to, to update and consolidate the best scientific knowledge about climate and environmental changes in the Mediterranean Basin and render it accessible to policymakers, key stakeholders and the public in order to facilitate ownership of scientific knowledge by them. Dr. Seyma Sharif and Ahnu Graz, our speakers this afternoon, will further develop on the climate and environmental change in the Mediterranean. I suppose that they will mention some of the contents of the MEDEC report, but I would like to highlight that they represent or they play two roles that we have in the MEDEC. The one from the scientific community and the other from this kind of, and of this, these people working on the, on creating the atmosphere or the, the, the conditions for a successful uh, transmission of scientific knowledge to policymakers. So we, I think that we have two very important speakers this afternoon, and I am sure that they will. Uh, give us some clear messages and some takes or take some messages and, and especially some recommendations for action. So let me introduce, let me introduce uh, the two speakers. Uh, first of all, we have, as I mentioned, I have already mentioned uh, Seyma Sharif. She's a full professor in the Department of Environment at the Institut, Institut Superior de Sciences Appliquées de Tunis. Um, she presently does research in atmospheric science, 
climate change and water science uh, using analytical chemistry, biological chemistry, statistics, modeling, and artificial intelligence. She's a member of, the, of MEDEC. Uh, she received uh, the Scientific Research Prize for the Environmental Technologies of the President of the Republic in 20, the Tunisian Republic in 29 and the prestigious uh, Maki Medal for Groundwater Protection, Restoration, or on Sustainable Use of the Water Environmental Population in 2013. And Arnaud Grafs uh, is a senior climate advisor in the Energy and Climate Action Unit at the Union for the Mediterranean. He holds a degree in environment, in environment and Public Works Engineering from the Ecole Nationale des Travaux Publics de l'État in, in France. He has an extended experience in several climate policies. Between 2012 and 2017, he was head of unit at the French National Center, CEREMA. Uh, he, he also was deputy chief at the Regional Economic Service of the French Embassy in Moscow, etc. So he has a very vast, uh, long experience. And I'm sure that both of, of them will, will uh, introduce, will give the, 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 uh, crucial overview or crucial vision of what's going on in the Mediterranean in terms of climate change. So, uh, same, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, I don't know if it is okay. You can see the, the slide? Yes, yes, we can. It's a full screen? Is it a full screen or not? No, it's not. You need to no. put it on full screen. Yeah, it, it's almost full screen. <laughs> okay. I don't know how I, I don't know how to I do it. I think it's on the right hand side. There yeah. You go. Because sometimes it works, sometimes not. Uh, I think it's in the, perhaps in the, in, it's in the right side, perhaps the, the third, you know, that there is a, I would do it another time. Sorry. Don't worry. Take your time. Okay, I think it's okay now. Yes. Okay. So, um, Good afternoon, everybody. So, bonjour. Assalamu alaikum in Le Pozdrao. So, uh, first of all, I have to thank everybody that invited me. So, the European Institute of Mediterranean, the Club of Rome, La Caixa Foundation, to this MED dialogue. And uh, I will talk uh, today about the state of art of the climate and environmental change in the Mediterranean. Of course, I cannot talk about all the, the problems and the issues of environmental change because there are thousands. So I choose to speak uh, about the specificity of the Mediterranean and uh, especially the, the main issues. So what are the main Mediterranean specificities? First of all, it is a hotspot, a world hotspot for biodiversity. We have 15,000 to 25,000 flora species and among them 60% are endemic. One third of the fauna also is endemic. It is also a hotspot, a world hotspot for climate change as the temperature in the Mediterranean increased more than in the other region of the globe, and we'll see it later. Unfortunately, it is also a world hotspot for sea plastic pollution. In fact, in the world, in the, the sea, we have many plastics, and we have especially these plastic gyres, perhaps you have heard of it. It's a kind of continent uh, full of plastic, so, so much, so much plastic in the sea that it makes continents. And there are five in, the, the, in all the oceans. And in these plastic gyres, there are one item, one item of plastics per cubic meter. 
In Mediterranean, we have exactly the same concentration of plastic that in this continents of plastic in the, in the world. So uh, it is really a big threat, this plastic pollution in the sea. The last point, but not the least, it's that uh, Mediterranean is uh, well known for its water scarcity, at, as it is the world's most water scarce region, especially the south of the Mediterranean. So let's talk first about the climate change and see what has already happened in our um, short history of warming. If you look at this curve, the blue one is for the Mediterranean and the green one is for the whole globe. We can see that there is a rise in temperature through the years, just a beginning uh, from the, in the industrial area. So, uh, after the industrial area, the temperature of the, the air has uh, risen really um, uh, in, increased very much. But uh, it, it's, this phenomenon is seen uh, in all, all around the globe, but it is especially um, in the Mediterranean after the 1980s, we see that there is a much higher increase for the Mediterranean by 20%. So the, the warming in our region is much higher than the warming in the whole globe. So now we have seen the history and now let's try to do some predictions. So uh, if we see uh, on the left, we, are the, we have the history, the black line, on the right, the rows and the um, the blue lines are the, the predictions of the temperature hiring in, uh, in the future. So uh, we have uh, two kinds of uh, predictions, a prediction with a, low, uh, with a low scenario and a high scenario. Uh, the lowest scenario predicts 1.5 degrees increase in temperature, and the highest scenario shows about a 5 uh, increase in temperature. What is the low and the high scenario here? It's the low greenhouse gas concentration scenario and the high greenhouse gas concentration scenario. What is the green gas uh, in this point, in this uh, here? So the green, uh, greenhouse gas uh, are the gases that are um, responsible of the climate change. So if uh, we are lowering our uh, consumption, in fact, uh, essentially our combustions and the traffic and industry and using all this uh, fuel and uh, coal, etc. So the combustion of fossil uh, fuels, uh, we have, uh, if we lower it, we will have the low greenhouse gas concentration scenario, so the blue line. If we are, will continue what we call the business as usual. So what we are already doing, it will be the high greenhouse gas concentration scenario, and we will have a five degrees uh, increase in uh, the temperature that is very, very much. So this climate change and environmental change is touching the essentials for human life. Sometimes we forget about them, but what are they? It is the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we, we eat and the home we are living in. So if first we will talk about the coastal area. If we are uh, looking to the medium scenario, but the medium scenario is uh, the scenario where, where uh, we will lower our emissions of greenhouse gases, but not uh, completely. So uh, in this case, we will have in uh, 2050, a one meter increase in sea level, uh, in the sea level. So all the region, all the coastal region of the Mediterranean will be submerged by the water if they are, if they have an altitude of less than one meter. So all the region, all the coastal area will be touched 
uh, in, uh, for, of this sea level rise, but some of them will be uh, soon uh, submerged. Here we have some examples of Italy in 2050, so in 30 years from now, we will see that all the region around Venice will be submerged. Also in Libya, the Misrata southern uh, region, in Egypt, Alexandria and Port Said, and many um, small islands that are low uh, in altitude, like the Kerkana Island in Tunisia, that more than a half will be submerged. It is very important here to note that this is, this is only a freeze frame. It is an instant picture of 2050, but this phenomena is going to continue. So it is not just like this region will be touched because it will continue and the even region that will be high, higher will be touched and will be submerged. Of course, if you don't stop uh, polluting with uh, greenhouse gases. Now we go to water resources. So uh, if we look at this um, figure of the whole world, uh, the regions in blue are the regions that are very lucky and have much water. And the region uh, in red, and the more it is red, dark, dark red, and the more there is a, an absolute scarcity, are concentrated in the southern Mediterranean. So it is very clear that it is a very, very vulnerable and very scarce region already. And you see this map is from the FAO from 2013. What are the water we are talking about? We, we are talking about, uh, re, um, so the, the, um, the, the water resources that are conventional and what are the conventional water we use to drink, irrigate, industrial, etc. It is uh, surface water and underground water. What is surface water? What, surface water is the water from rivers, from wadi, and uh, from lakes, for example. So here uh, I choose an example of the Kaseb Dam in Tunisia, that is a very big dam in the northern part of the country, and do some projection of what will happen uh, due to the what is already happening and what can happen. Uh, with this uh, evaporation, with this climate change. So uh, the, the, uh, the orange and the red part in, uh, on the right are uh, the scenarios if uh, the evaporation is zero or 3%, so the old uh, evaporation before 2008, that what is not the case. In fact, the evaporation now between 2008 and 2030 was 6%. And with this evaporation that is already, uh, already going, uh, we will have a depletion, a total depletion of water in this specific dam before the end of the century. And if we have more an increase in temperature, so an increase in evaporation, the, the depletion can even be earlier. This is only an example because we have to see it to, to, uh, to feel it and understand it. This evaporation is occurring in all the water surface in uh, all the world and especially in Mediterranean as we see that we have an, uh, a, a more uh, um, a higher increase in temperature. So here we, we can prove that we are going to have a depletion of surface water. What's uh, the point with underground water? Uh, here we have two pictures. One uh, on the left, it is the, the sea level, normal sea level. Uh, and uh, on, on the left, we have the well that is pumping fresh water. Fresh water is the blue uh, light uh, on the left and um, salt water that is on, on the ground, underground is on the, um, uh, so the, the, on the, under the sea and goes under the earth. So the well is pumping fresh water, but if the sea level uh, will rise, the um, sea water that is underground 
will go more underground uh, in uh, in the land and the, the well that was pumping fresh groundwater will now pump salty groundwater. So this phenomena was already been uh, seen uh, when we, we have over pumping from the well, but with sea level rise, it will be accelerated and increased. So for underground water, we already have the problem of very high pollution with biologic and uh, chemical, uh, um, chemical co um, contaminants. We have already uh, a depletion of uh, uh, aquifers because of the overpumping. Of course, if the temperature rises, evaporation rises, we need to irrigate more. And we don't have, we have, we have to remember that in the Mediterranean, 70 to 80% of the water is used for agriculture. So uh, the, the overpumping is not um, a local phenomena and, or, or a ma minor phenomena. It has to be considered very seriously and it, it has already uh, lead, uh, led uh, to, to depletion of many wells and with sea level rise, the coastal wells will be uh, even uh, salinized. So now we have talked about the quantity, so depletion of surface water and underground water and the quality. But the quality of water is in a big threat also. So we have chemical contamination by pesticides, heavy metals, nutrient for agriculture, pH, antibiotics, endocrine disruptors of many, many kinds, hundreds of endocrine disruptors. Endocrine disruptors are uh, contaminants that can change the, the chemical bioreaction in the body because they will act as hormones and uh, even at very low uh, concentrations. We will also have physical contamination like microplastics. We already seen them in the sea and even the fishes in the fishes we can, we can have uh, um, tens of um, uh, microplastics and they will go in our body and they will uh, carry with them uh, other contaminants. We can have also nanomaterials that come from electronics and even we have nanomaterials in food and in the industrial uh, products like toothpaste, etc. Nanomaterials are materials that are very, very small and can go to our brain, our heart, etc. and interfere with biochemical reaction in our body. Of course, we can have, we will have also biological, we have it, also biological contamination by fecal coliform viruses, protozoa, parasitic worms, etc., coming from wastes, uh, human wastes and essentially uh, waste waters. And of course, uh, uh, salinization that we have talked uh, just uh, before. About. So we have done, uh, it's not me, <laughs> but the world has done a short full scale test when they did the COVID-19 lockdown. And what we see is surface and groundwater pollution reduction and uh, air pollution has been reduced for NO2 essentially. NO2 comes from the combustion of fossil fuels and uh, it was reduced uh, because of the restriction of surface traffic and of non-essential industries. And of course also the noise reduction. Of course, we cannot say anything uh, after these uh, results because it's only for a few months and it's difficult to, to put it in the scale of, of what has already been done for 180 years of pollution, of massive pollution. So now we will talk about the threat on food. So I choose, uh, I like very much this example of wheat because Mediterranean region represents 60% of the world's grown area for durum wheat. And that all the country or main Mediterranean countries eat wheat uh, daily uh, in pasta or bread or couscous. So it is a very important food in Mediterranean and it's just an example as we will see. So in the left uh, picture, that is uh, yellow, we can see that we have uh, two uh, weeds and uh, the smallest is the one 
that was uh, stressed with no watering uh, for five days. So only five days no watering leads to a decrease in the size and, uh, of the weeds. On the right uh, side, on the right picture, we see even uh, another phenomenon due, this, uh, due to, to the same uh, water stress of five days. Uh, so here we have uh, uh, we have lost some grains in the in the wheat. So now we were talking we talk about uh, drought, but we can talk also about temperature. So because drought and temperature are not exactly the same because the drought is related to many with many parameters, the duration and uh, the quantity of water, etc. But there is also the problem of temperature. For each degree uh, rise, we are uh, we have 7.5 percent of wheat yield reduction. So, with the high uh, greenhouse gas scenario uh, expected in 2019, we had we already seen that we will have five degree rise in temperature. So, with these predictions, we will have. 37.5, about, about this percent of real reduction in wheat. And this wheat reduction is, is also in addition to water deficiency that will be uh, that reduced to uh, 34, 35 to 75% of the, the grain of the wheat. Another phenomenon is that when we reach 30 degrees during the floret of the wheat, we completely, we completely lose the wheat. It's completely, uh, we, we, we reach complete sterility, so we will not have any wheat at all. Of course, uh, now, nowadays, it's not the case because uh, 30 degrees, it's only rich in May, and the floret is about March, April, but if the, it goes to increase, the temperature goes to increase, it will be uh, earlier that we will have this high temperatures. Another uh, food that is very uh, common in Mediterranean is the fish. We already have done many, many, uh, how can I say? <laughs> so many things that are really bad for our, uh, our fishes and all uh, our marine life for on fauna and flora. So between 1950 and 2011, so only in 50 years, we have lost 41% of top marine predators and 34% uh, uh, of fish species, only in 50 years. In 33 years from 1994 and 2017, Mediterranean total fishery rendings declined by 28%. That means that when this is uh, the quantity of fish that have been fished in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, so in 33 years, we have fished 28% less uh, quantity of fish. So what will what will happen with the increase in temperature? One degree increase in temperature made uh, the, the body size of a fish decrease by 20 to 30 percent. This is only for one degree. So let's imagine for five degree. This is because, in fact, if you don't, if you rise temperature in the sea, there is a low, lower oxygen concentration in water, so the, the fish cannot breathe and it adapt and make make his body slower, uh, um, uh, smaller. So all these problems uh, around fishing are caused by warming, of course, and acidification, but also the over overfishing and bad fishing habits, uh, pollution and invasive species that come from other seas that like very much Mediterranean because it's warm and it's calm and they don't have their, the predators that they have in their original uh, habitat. So what is going to happen around 2050? I remember that uh, 
I want to remember you that is in 30 years. So uh, a local extension of up to 50% of exploited fish and marine invertebrates. So 50% of this uh, marine uh, fauna that we use, that we explode, that we eat, will be extinct in 30 years. So climate change, environmental change will touch our essentials. So the water we drink and irrigate with, surface waters will evaporate, underground water will uh, be salinized, and both of them will, are, are already very much polluted. We will, don't, we will not have enough food because uh, the yields are going to lower and the coastal area are going to be submerged. It's not very good news, but I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, this presentation and learned something uh, new. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would like to say that if you want more details, you can find it on the MedEgg web, uh, website where you will find also the report of 634 pages with many, many details about this climate and environmental change. We will also have some summary uh, for people that don't want to, to read all these pages. And uh, I invite you to go and uh, to learn uh, more about the subject. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sadia. I mean, in a normal situation, we will have to applaud you, but it's, it's kind of, it's, different. it's difficult to read. To, to read. But thank you for, for your message. And yes, uh, it's important that you recommend it, the report that, I mean, we can find it uh, in, on the Medec website and also the summary uh, for policy maker in English, French, uh, Arab, uh, Spanish, Catalan, and I'm making that uh, we will set up the week and the version uh, very soon. So we are all invited to read at least the summary for policy makers and not only, I mean, you are invited to read it, but also to act and to react to this, to this, to this, to this, to this report. Now, uh, I would like to, to give a floor to Arnaud Graf, who will uh, comment on the, 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 what Senia has uh, explained. So Arnaud knows very well the Medec report. I mean, the Medec report is there because of some other people, uh, Arnaud. So um, Arnaud, the report is yours. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir Arnaud. Good evening. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Merci beaucoup, chers partenaires, chers collègues. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you, Professor Sedia, for your presentation. The UFM has been working thanks to Arnaud and our partners the United Nations Program for the Natural Environment, as we have just been reminded. For the UFM, the best policy to be followed by political decision makers is the one that has a crucial perspective for the region to respond to challenges that are clearly exposed in this report. And if I have to talk about a parallel with the global world, I would ask the following. The works developed about climate and biodiversity are a crucial frame of reference. It is already a reality with regards to the, the MEG works in the Mediterranean. It is the scientific reference in terms of climate change and in terms of biodiversity and the natural environment. We won't be able to say anymore what that we didn't know. Science has spoken up, so now we have to listen to it. We have to understand it, and we also need to contribute to disseminate its knowledge. Thank you, Arnau, and thank you, IEMED, for this report. The main challenge we face nowadays is to assure 
that this scientific knowledge is well understood and well disseminated in the different among the people who have decision making power in order to take action as soon as possible and with the maximum economic efficiency. This is important so that the scientific recommendation is well used in decision making processes with real elements to build up this new policy in terms of resilience and adaptation. We have started this work with programs for the use of climate services for the different economic sectors. Start with the world, world forecasting, weather forecasting service and EUPOS. We have to know about the Mediterranean as it been recognized for other regions and other countries like the small island states. Time is pressing and the means are not yet up to standard. We need to look for funds and resources to invest in infrastructures in, and we need to train, inform and invest in research education. We need to use fully the Paris Agreement to act. In this Paris Agreement, this Paris Agreement has to actually be implemented. And this cooperation framework offers excellent instruments for countries on the southern shore. In fact, we believe that now we are starting to see all the potential benefits of this agreement. And the next decade will actually see how these tools can be useful. The contributions made at a national level by the CNN, NDC, this year before COPTIS will be a significant landmark. As you know, Lebanon has a crisis. It's undergoing a crisis. And it is a country that is very much aware of the dangers and risks in the Mediterranean. And they will make it compatible. The CDNs are approaching numerous goals and not only on the climate front. And the review of the CDMs will be an opportunity, a great opportunity. And in fact, they will become increasingly structured with multiple co-benefits for all of the ODSs, for all of the SDGs to reinforce capacity of southern countries to assure technolo technology transfers and to reinforce their capacities and to assure the respect of the financial commitments of northern countries with regard to, which will be followed up very closely during the whole period and we have to remember that as soon as possible we have to go beyond all of it even if there are different approaches in between the different countries, between zero and more. The international community recognizes that we need to maintain all of this in a hypersensitive region like the Mediterranean. We will have to do everything at hand, not to go beyond 1.5 degrees. And we want to attain this goal, we will have to be very strict. The Mediterranean has to assume a global perspective. The world will need for that to actually will be looking at this region. This year we have had, we have been able to convey all of these messages thanks to significant UPM regional meetings with the IUCM summit in Marseille and the 26 agreement in Strasbourg, we will may make a contribution as we have been able to do at the UPM because we 
created a new committee for the region. We have opened the discussion about the links between political science and society, thanks to its great media impact. We have been quoted more than 2,000 times in all of the languages, in all languages in the region. Let me give you some examples of good administration actions. Let me mention MEDEC, not only to talk about the Maoran report, but because of the cooperation spirit that will prevail in the future. Inside the scientific committee, because it's a very solid, robust network that has been developed because of its voluntary spirit and because of all of the impact that has come from the external world through policies and the people, the technical officers, the media and the civil society. And I have to point out that following the proposal made by the UFM, the MEDEC has been actually taken to the Council of Europe and at the United Nations. Mr. Kofi Annan and Madame Simone Weil and Queen Afana Abdullah have given it its support to it. And this year we will have a, a chance to know more about it. It is well, another indirect result of the BEDEC report is that the sector chosen for the next program of the EU is related to the climate, renewables, and health. This gives us perspectives after many years of research, innovation, and investment. But we also have other initiatives based on the UPA, for example, the funding, especially to respond to all of it. The first work has shown that adaptation projects are very poorly funded in the region. And this poor funding is especially true in some countries in the region. And locally, the territories are the poor relations and they have problems to access funding. With regards to these different challenges, UPM has developed multiple approaches to try to respond to it. And thanks to the work of this, the, the liberalization of UPM, uh, a project funded by the European Union, and through different cooperation agreements. And about these agreements, I'd like to point out the cooperation agreement with Air Vent, the Air 20 network, Foundation for Action Against Climate Change, has given already fruit with its partners, the International Network for the Conservation of Nature, the fund. Parva has developed a global action plan that has been approved by the, and thanks to the support of the UPM by seven countries in the region. And we will prepare a second file that will be complementary to the first one. Other initiatives will also be developed throughout the decade. And I hope that we'll have a good chance to mention them. Thank you for your attention. I have to say, or no, that this report is very important. The cost to systemic action and political action. And that's what you were referring to, right? Yes, indeed. We have renewed our preparation agreement with the action, Regional Action Center, NEPAF, 
soutien financier pour ces technical de montage et euh, support et all of these works will start very soon I have to say that EFEC is an independent body. But we have the Principality of Monaco. Well, we have a comment from Joseph Canals. And he says, it's a comment, he says, uh, well, we need to raise awareness among the general public with specific examples of effect, like the ones showed by Professor, Professor Said. Uh, municipalities have a lot to do in this regard. And this comment links to, uh, to, to it's, I mean, it links to a uh, first question to specific to Tenia. Uh, selon vous, Seigneur, les populations, surtout au sud de la Méditerranée, sont-elles suffisamment conscientes des de conséquences du changement climatique? Comment les peuples Are communities on the southern shore aware enough about climate change? And which are the priorities in certain countries like Turkey? Have you been able to listen to me well? Oui, il y a un petit problème parce qu'on a la, la traduction. May I speak in French? Yes, please. Yes, in fact, je ne peux donner que mon avis. I can only give my own opinion. I do not believe that the populations on the southern shore are aware about the seriousness of the situation. Le changement climatique du fait, du fait des vagues de chaleur. They are aware about heat waves and heat waves. But beyond that, I do not believe they are aware about the general climate change emergency. Or certain local actions that are undertaken in some country, but we do not hear anybody talking about them. And they are quite minor, to be honest. At any rate, that's my own personal opinion. On a une autre question, mais je vais uh, la poser en, en, en anglais. And we have another question have you measured the that's for both of you economic and social costs of climate change in the Mediterranean um, if ongoing trends are not reversed are there studies on this so it's for it's for for you both Samia or Arnaud I can, I can just ask partially and then Arnaud can uh, answer also if he has an answer. I think it's something very difficult to, to measure because uh, it's, uh, as you see, there are hundreds, thousands of parameters. How can you measure the influence on water evaporation, for example, on, uh, on food and then extrapolate it to economic, um, you know, impact on people mm -hmm. uh, of course you can but it's uh, very complicated and uh, i don't think it has been done because in the medec report it was very difficult to have um, uh, this kind of information and uh, i don't think that uh, it has already been done on all, only for some points you know what is the influence of this phenomena on economy and social and etc okay Arnaud? Oui, alors je pense qu'on peut euh, cependant quand même faire well, référence à certaines études qui sont. Well, de... this question refers to certain studies carried out globally, not only at for our Mediterranean region. Euh, et qui, euh, en, en termes de conclusion, je dirais directement. As a conclusion, ça, I would say that. L'inaction climatique coûte beaucoup plus lack cher. Lack of action is much more expensive favorable investments, the favorable investment for the climate. And the fact we invest in mitigation policies, in climate mitigation policies, is above 
the costs of non-action, which would be some very recent examples in the region. France is facing a new climate phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, crops that come too early and agriculture, agriculturalists were not insured for that and they lost their crop. And well, the, the, the effects could be infinite. With regards to the territorial communities, I, you have given the example of Timanad, but I'd like to say that this is a project that moves 100 countries in eight, 100 cities in eight countries in the region. There isn't enough communication. Still, this type of exercise allows us to collect that information. But of course, there is a lot of awareness raising, capacity building, training, and education to be carried out throughout. Yes, that's clear. I believe that we need to explain very, very well to the population, you know, the challenges posed by climate change. Because we always talk about the economic and financial effects, but there is also an adaptation side to all of it, so that society is actually able to manage the social and psychological impacts of climate change, because those will also be a reality as well. Now, we have mentioned the term adaptation, and I have a question that comes from the audience about adaptation. And it is a question for both of you in English. Adequate to achieve climate-related SDGs by 2030, what concrete mitigation and adaptation policy should be established as priorities in the following years? It's, it's, a, it's a big question. Do you, I mean, I don't know if you want that I, re, I repeat it or did you, did you take it? Because I think I have some problems with, with my macro, microphone. I can repeat again. I don't know. Uh, Arno, uh, it's okay for you? Oui, oui. Oui, je, je vais peut-être continuer à décliner ce que je précisais tout à l'heure dans mon discours. Euh, C'est notamment euh, ce qui est en train d'être préparé dans le cadre des contributions déterminées au niveau national. Le point est de faire en sorte que nous puissions développer les accords de Paris ou toutes les politiques pour l'énergie efficiente et le développement des sources renouvelables d'énergie are favorable for the struggle against climate change. And we have the example of France, where there is a new ambitious document within the framework for the preparation of COVID-26. And we have perspectives that are quite ambitious too with regards to all of this. Now, with regards to adaptation, um, more mature. Doubtlessly, uh, it is less strong than adaptation. From a strategic point of view, we can see what the EU has done in terms of adaptation. And it affects part of the Mediterranean, of course. We have, in order to have as big an action as possible in our basin in consulting scientific bodies that will be adhering to the adaptation strategy. The deck is part of this so that the EU work can also benefit southern countries. 
and vice versa, so that Bedek can also benefit from the experience of southern shore countries in terms of the management of water and the impact of heat waves, etc. Thank you. Would you like to add anything, Samia? No, not really. I do not have anything to say about politics or policies. I am a scientist. Well, but you need, I mean, you know, scientists need to speak up in order to inform politicians, in order to inform the policy. Well, but I believe it depends very much on the country. It depends on which country we are referring to. What's very important fact, and this I'm saying it as a scientist, we need to adapt. Because nowadays, human beings believe that we have dominated nature. We have dominated our environment. And that's not the case at all. We are made up of bacteria, virus, and microorganisms. And we need to adapt to that. And it's the same, the same is applicable to climate change. We have made many mistakes and now we have to try and correct them. Not by adding force, but with a multiple approach. And that's so important because we will not find a single solution that solves everything. We've done thousands of things, thousands of polluting actions. And we cannot revert all of that with one single action. First of all, we need cooperation between the North and the South. That's absolutely crucial, not only in terms of technology transfer, which is one thing, but with real political agreements. It is a political problem because once the political decision has been made, in my opinion, we will be able to unblock many things because it is a problem both in terms of societies, as you have said, we need, we need to inform people so that they realize what's going on, so that they can actually act and accept the changes, etc. And at a political level, on the political front, we need political will so that actions are really undertaken. Because if we have no choice, we will do it. And let me repeat, these are cooperation actions and multiple actions that we need. Well, it is a political issue, but it's also a social issue, the social question. We have another question here about... We're talking now about, we come to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have, of course, a question about COVID-19. COVID-19 related to climate change. And the question is for both of you in English. Pandemic affects climate and environmental change in the Mediterranean region. And has the COVID-19 hindered our efforts towards the implementation of SDG 13 related to climate action? What do you think about this? Um, I didn't hear the... Yeah. So uh, the second is, uh, and has the COVID-19 hindered effort to, towards the implementation of SDG 13, which is a climate action, mm -hmm. related to climate action? So, so in fact, I, I just touched the problem in the, mm -hmm. by the, it is a scientific part, not the political part. <laughs> so um, in fact, there was, it, it's, it was not long enough, as I told in my speech, uh, that the lockdown uh, cannot uh, show really uh, some impact on uh, pollution. Uh, because also, when the lockdown uh, ended, we have a rebound effect. So uh, there was more pollution than before, uh, just for a period of time. But uh, in the few months when there were lockdowns in uh, in some in uh, in the whole world, in fact, uh, because there were studies that were were done on 100 and and a few uh, countries, mm -hmm. and we can see that there was an increase a decrease in uh, NO2 and NOx, so it's one kind of polluted of the air. Uh, 
so uh, NO2 is known that with the problem of uh, respiration and uh, lungs uh, problems. But we have also an increase in uh, other pollutants like ozone. So we cannot conclude about this. Uh, on, the, um, on waters, the effect was very clear. Uh, we have cleaner waters and the cleaner coastal uh, sediments and cleaner coastal waters. Uh, we have done tests with chlorophyll A for, a for people that know what is it. So it's uh, an indication of pollution. So the pollution has uh, decreased uh, in uh, seawater, in underground water, and in rivers. Uh, I, I think it's just because the industrial, uh, uh, industrial pollution has uh, decreased. So, of course, if the, uh, the, uh, the factories are closed, so they cannot pollute. I think that's, uh, it's, only, it's only this point. Um, for, uh, and also, I, I thought that there was a, a decrease in noise. Uh, also, I think because there is no traffic, there is no industry, so of course the noise will decrease. Uh, as for the CDG, I think I will leave the, the words to um, Mr. Gray. Okay, Arnaud? Oui. Perfect. Arnaud, yes. Indeed, we have all observed a number of consequences and effects real positive effects on the natural environment. But basically, infrastructures have not changed. So the economic fundamentals as regards the consequences of economic activity on climate change have not really changed. On the other hand, the enormous impact that COVID-19 had in terms of awareness raising about the link between natural, the natural environment and human being could have some dramatic consequences. And this awareness raising has been very significant. There are lessons to be learned to understand better how this impact could be used between inverted commas to better rebuild our economies and to use these relaunching plants and to make them as green as possible. Because a large part of the population is well aware that to continue exploiting natural resources which has been the case up to now, is not sustainable. And that's why pandemics like COVID-19 have had catastrophic consequences. I believe that the lesson we have learned is awareness raising. And we need to build up relaunching plants that are as green as possible in order not to fall back into the mistakes that we fell into after the 2008 crisis, because we had an enormous amount, an enormous increase of greenhouse effects after the 2008 crisis. The International Energy Agency's report was quite alarming last week, but with what was announced yesterday by the, by the very Energy International Agency about its advice with regards to stop using fossil fuels is a real turning point in the world of energy. We have to remember that the IEU, which is the armed arm of the World Trade Organization, talked about energy security issues based on oil reserves. So there is a paradigm change here, an enormous paradigm change, because the announcement made yesterday showed that new roads are possible in order to achieve net, a zero net carbon emissions by 2050. Yes. Yes. Right, if you allow me, I'd like, I'd like to also make a comment. Indeed, 
I also wanted to talk about the awareness raising uh, as regards our viral environment. And this is very important because it is something that many ecologists say for a long time, and I'm an ecologist in addition to being a scientist, we say that when we destroy a natural environment, viruses and different illnesses that beforehand attacked wild animals can actually start attacking pets and domestic animals. And this is what has happened recently in many countries. And I'm referring to what happened some years before. And there have been different countries in which certain serious illness epidemics have occurred due to the pets. And they had actually stemmed from wild animals that had lost their natural habitats. And instead of transmitting these illnesses to other wild animals, he transmitted them to domestic pets, and the domestic pets passed them on to human beings. Yes, indeed. I think that COVID-19 has allowed us to become very much aware about these dangers, at least in Europe. This will be accelerated soon in order to manage the consequences of COVID. To give rise to this new Green Deal that had been defined before the pandemic. But this is so important to be able to speed up things, especially a Mediterranean Green Deal. In fact, Arno has mentioned the Energy International Alliances report, and I'd like to recommend that report to everybody, especially the conclusions they reach. And when the International Energy Agency sent the message that we should stop using fossil fuels, I believe that it is truly a paradigm change. We need to adapt and follow the message. There is a question about energy here. And this will be the last question as we need to finish in seven minutes time, I believe, and we will be very punctual. So the question in English is, it is for Arnaud, but Semia could also answer it. Is there and it says the following. Plan to encourage renewable energy projects in the non-EU member Mediterranean countries. So I repeat, is there an action plan to encourage renewable energy projects in the non-EU member Mediterranean countries? I think it's not... Arno, do you know if there are some, some action plans? Hello. Uh, well, in the founding act of the Union for the Mediterranean, there is an appendix in this founding document, a program called Solar Mediterranean Plan, which tries to develop a maximum amount of renewable energy throughout Mediterranean countries. That plan has not come to reality yet. It has not been carried out. But the works promoted at the beginning of 2010 have allowed, have allowed us to launch different platforms, cooperation platforms in the field of energy within the UFM, specifically in the field of energy efficiency and renewables and the electric interconnection. I, I'm, I mentioned gas as well, but with a, with a new perspective that imply new sources of energy. With, with, with regards to the 
gas networks, we have to look beyond. Now, this plan that had been imagined, in a way, a bit too really top down, to use the typical English expression, has generated the, cre the creation of these platform. And it, it, and after the declaration of the UFM in 2014, it will be carried out and approved on the 10th of June in Portugal during the ministerial summit and they will continue with their works in this field. So it is not a plan or a master plan, so to speak. It's not a roadmap, but many, many initiatives and projects have stemmed. In a more bottom-up fashion, we have projects that come from the bottom and that crop up where the need is the greatest. And of course, renewable solar, renewable energy sources are one of the main vectors for this operation and for the projects that are to come. Semia. The problem of energy is not my specialty, but I have actually studied it a little bit. But I, I didn't understand why southern countries are not more involved. The use of solar energy in Tunisia, for example, is not great, although it's one of the sunniest countries in the world. There are many, many projects that have been brought forward. I believe that we need to encourage, we need to encourage people through financial motivators, tax reductions, because solar panels are very expensive. So in my opinion, we need fiscal and financial motivators. I believe that we need to encourage people to use that. That's my opinion after what I've seen. Well, it implies an investment at all levels, all the way to the private person. Yes, both a private person's investment and also societal or company in investment. Well, uh, allow me to conclude about this point. Say that we should actually have a fourth report devoted to mitigation and energy in order to go back to Ruan's energy chapter, which unfortunately is the one that will age faster due to the acceleration of the energy transition that has just been announced and that has been confirmed with what the International Energy Agency announced yesterday. Fully agree, fully agree. In fact, it is the chapter that will age the fastest, as you have said. But more about energy transition in the Mediterranean, please take note that the second uh, dialogue in this cycle will focus on energy. So I, I think that Josep Will and Jamma uh, allow me to, 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 to make this remark because the, the, the next uh, dialogue that will take place on the 16th June, please take note of this date, uh, 16th June 2021 will focus on uh, accelerating the energy transition in the southern and Eastern Mediterranean, key factors and challenges. I mean, I think that you made some very interesting points, and I hope that uh, that the organizers will take note of this of, of, of your points. But it is a crucial topic, not only in the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries, but also in the European shore, in the northern shore. You know that, for instance, here in in in, in Catalonia, but in all the other 
we are accelerating, or we should accelerate the, this transition, and it's a crucial topic just now. So uh, it's time for closing the session. If Jaume uh, and Josep uh, agree with this, with this idea, in order to be sharp, um, thank you very much. I mean that what the main this is, was an initial debate, initial session to to set the the scene. The main it's it's obvious and we agree we already know but we, we are more convinced than ever that climate change is one of the key challenges for ecosystems i mean for the environment but also for economies and for societies it is important but one of the main points that medec the mark one the the, the, the medec report highlight is that it's not only i mean we are experiencing this the climate change but also um, the environmental change, which is, they're linked, but they are not, I mean, not everything that happens in the Mediterranean should be related to climate change. I mean, the way we build the cities, or we expand the cities, the way we uh, behave in terms of, of consumers, uh, as, uh, the impact of activities of economic activities on the environment i mean they are they they, they provide a combination of factors drivers affecting uh, the climate and the environment in the mediterranean um, we are i think that we should be proud of the mediterranean people i think that we learn how to adapt to difficult climate conditions and environmental conditions historically i mean the Mediterranean people, Mediterranean societies, Mediterranean economies have been adapting to severe or to, to difficult conditions historically, and we should be proud of it because we knew about climate change just before other regions started talking about climate change. You know, and the point is that, uh, but now the, 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 the point is that we will be severely affected by climate change. Climate change is there uh, with this tremendous economic environmental cost and there is no time to uh, to, to, to wait to, 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 for production. You know, Jauma know me, Josep know me and Arno Ossi uh, and they know that when I start speaking I can be, I can speak for hours without saying <laughs> almost anything so the shorter the better uh, so thank you very much thank you for uh, professor semi sharif and ethnographs uh, for your contributions i hope that they were uh, i'm sure they were interesting, interesting for for the audience and josep uh, and jama thank you for inviting the, the three of us uh, i'm sure that we will uh, follow the second dialogue also in order to to learn and to contribute in terms uh, on, on, on the energy transition. So thank you, uh, merci beaucoup, bonne soirée, good evening, bon vespre, uh, buenas noches. Bien. Beaucoup, bonne soirée. Au revoir, merci. Au revoir. <laughs>